Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles. Uh, and today we're going to be talk, uh, talking about the construction and evaluation exam. Uh, we're actually going to use a mock exam and we're going to cover a variety of topics uh, for this particular division of the ARE. And then after this episode, uh, you should walk away and feel like you have, you know, kind of a good sense, some of the tools you need to help you understand the concepts and principles um, for some of the key topics that will be covered in the construction and evaluation exam. Uh, in our next ARE Live, uh, we're going to be giving you an interesting sort of sneak peek at one of Mike's top tips for passing the ARE, which is going to be straight from his A19 presentation. So we're heading down to Las Vegas in, uh, I don't know, six weeks or so. It's going to be a blast. Uh, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, if you're Mike's, there, come on by. Mike's going to be giving uh, an awesome presentation, the top tips to pass the ARE. Um, so we're going to be focusing on uh, uh, know your contracts. So we're going to do a deep dive into the B101, A201, A101, um, uh, and that should be a really good one. So, um, of course, you know, during Mike's lecture at A19, he's going to cover a variety of topics. Uh, this one we're going to do a deep dive in at our next ARE Live. So if you want to hop over to... Um, our podcast page right now. You can go ahead and register for that if you'd like to attend the next one. Um, Please to tell you if you haven't heard that uh, we're the first ever, so Black Spectacles is the first ever NCARB approved test prep provider for all six of ARE 5.0 and uh, that approval includes all of our study materials, uh, lectures, practice exams, flashcards, um, so you have a little bit of uh, comfort to know that our content's been reviewed by those guys. Uh, as I always like to tell people, if you'd like your boss to pay for your Black Spectacles membership, be sure to tell them about our firm licenses. Uh, for firms of any size, uh, we offer a customized license that gives multiple users access, group admin, reporting, all that good stuff. You can go to blackspectacles.com firms to learn more about that. And today, we, uh, as we often do, we'll have a special discount on Black Spectacles individual memberships to share. Uh, and I'll provide that coupon uh, at the end of the show. Uh, our guest today, of course, is Mike Newman. If you don't know Mike, he's a senior lecturer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio, and he's the instructor for Black Spectacles online ARE exam prep. Uh, so thanks for joining us today, Mike. Thank you. Um, yeah, today we'll be uh, taking everyone's questions using the GoToWebinar question box. Um, and if you completed the mock exam that we sent out last week and got all the questions right, you will be the happy winner of a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. Uh, so with that, uh, let's uh, hand it over to Mike and take a look at that first question. Okay, uh, so welcome aboard. We're just going to jump right in here. Um, and just a reminder that the construction evaluation is its essentially the kind of what the architect's role is and what are the things going on around uh, during the construction, the build-up to construction, and then sort of post-construction uh, issues. So uh, all of those kind of realms where, for the most part, your your design work is done, your your uh, detailing work is done, except as it relates to during the construction process and, and all of the issues that come up. Uh, it, so one of the things that means is that this particular exam is a lot about communication because part of the role of the architect during that phase is about sort of making sure that the owner understands what's going on, communicating well with the contractor so that everything runs smoothly, etc. cetera. Um, so you'll actually find there's quite a lot of similarity, a little bit oddly, quite a lot of similarity with project management uh, because so much of the discussion is around kind of uh, contracts and communication systems. But let's jump into the first question. So the first one we have here is, during the bid process, one of the bidders calls the architect and asks a question of clarification on the drawing set. The architect should, question mark, and then we have four possible answers. Produce an appropriate change order to correct or clarify the information. Add the question to a list uh, for possible future addenda. Answer the question in order to keep all the bidder responses for uh, equal for apple-to-apple -apple comparisons. You should never answer the question. Everyone must use the same documents for their bid response. So uh, this one is really just sort of setting up uh, to see if you understand a couple of different things. Uh, and the first one is that in answer D, a part of it is correct, but a part of it is definitely wrong. So the part that's correct in answer D is uh, everyone should use the same documents for their bid response. 
Uh, it's really important uh, that when you have bidders, multiple bidders, uh, looking at a set of drawings, the specifications, the bid forms, it's already a pretty confusing situation. You want to make sure that you don't have subtle variations between one bidder and another. So it's hugely important that everybody's using the same bid information. But the previous, the earlier part of that answer says uh, that you should never answer their questions. Well, obviously you should answer their questions. That doesn't make any sense. If they have real questions, you want to get real information back. It doesn't make sense uh, to not want to get real information. So we like part of D, but not D. So we know that it's not D. Uh, and we know that uh, answering the question is actually a bad idea too. So it's not C. Now, why would just answering the question be bad? Well, because if you answer the question with one bidder, that means not all of the bidders get the same information. And you want to make sure that they all have the ability to have apples to apples information. Uh, it's not reasonable for one bidder to know one clarifying piece of information other, that other ones don't. And it could either drive their prices up or their prices down. It's just that you wouldn't be able to know that their price was this, based on the same information that, uh, that the others would be. So then it comes down to A or B. And we know that it's not A because if we look at A again, produce an appropriate change order. Right? A change order or change to what? Well, the change uh, of a change order is a change to the contract, but you're at a bid phase. We don't have a contract yet, not until one of the bidders is chosen, and then they have a contract, get a contract with the owner, uh, presumably an A101, AIA A101 owner contractor agreement. Uh, and so you only use the term change order once you already have a general contractor already associated with the project. So that means that our answer is B. And so B is add the question to a list for possible future addenda. Now, if it's a good question and it's an important question, it might speed the process to creating the addenda. You could send an addenda out with just only one question and one answer. Uh, but the concept here is that as an architect, you have put together the bid forms. You've put together the way that you want the contractors to respond. You've created the package that's including the drawing set and the specifications uh, with the project manual. And that bid form has a breakdown on it about how you want to get the information back. Uh, and so you're, you're creating, you're, you're trying to create the way that the contractors are going to give you the information. You're trying to sort of manage that process. And one of the things that's going to happen, bound to uh, on essentially any bid package, uh, is that you might find mistakes or just things that you think should have additional information or uh, something that uh, the owner said after they looked at the bid set and you thought, well, maybe that's not quite what we meant. Uh, uh, and then the bidders are likely to have questions. And so you're going to sort of put together all the questions that you get. And as you get a sort of a grouping of good questions, you're going to put those into what's officially referred to as the addenda. And you might have one, you might have two, three, four, uh, and they would be named and dated. And then you group those questions together and you answer the questions or clarifications. And then that addenda gets issued and it becomes an official part of the bid set, which then becomes an official part of the contract set once the bidder is chosen. So it's a very specific process. You gather all the questions that come in, either from in-house or from the bidders. Uh, you put it all together into a, uh, an addenda. Just uh, it has to be dated and, and the addenda has to be numbered so that it can be referenced uh, in other contract uh, information. And then uh, submit that uh, addenda to all of the bidders so that way they have the drawing set, they have the specifications, they have the bid forms, and they have all the all the addenda, uh, and that creates the entire uh, bid package. All right, sweet. We're down to 91 folks here. We've got that one right. All right, number two. The client can move in after A, final completion, B, punch list completion, C, substantial completion, D, declaration of final, final waiver of lien. Uh, so, this one uh, is, there's a, a fairly straightforward aspect to this, but it's mostly just making sure 
that you have an idea of what all the different uh, sort of deadlines and days and sp sort of specific declarations are towards the end of a, of a project. Uh, the client can move in after a final completion. Well, of course they can move in after final completion. It's finally complete. But, you know, final completion could be, you know, months and months and months after mostly completed. You know, imagine a situation where the uh, cabinets that you ordered from Germany come in uh, and they're really beautiful, but, oh, turns out one was the wrong size. So you take it out and you reorder that cabinet and maybe it takes five months to get it. Like, really, nobody's going to move in because there's one cabinet missing. Uh, so final completion often is way down the road. There's all sorts of things, uh, punch lists that take a long time or, or materials that just don't show up or uh, inspectors that can't get out until something uh, to see something. Uh, so final completion is a completely reasonable answer, except that it's, uh, it's just not uh, going to be the best answer because it can be so much farther down the road uh, than when a client is likely to want to move in. Uh, punch list completion is kind of like final completion in that sense. The punch list is that uh, document that gets made. Uh, technically, it's made by the GC, uh, although often in everyday life, uh, the architects actually will make the punch list. But the GC uh, makes the punch list, and then the architect and the GC review the punch list. Uh, the architect may add to it. And the punch list is all those little things that didn't quite get finished right. So problems with the little painting, uh, the, uh, you turn the hot water on and it comes out cold. Uh, the, the window is uh, a little bit off straight and so it doesn't open and close quite right or the lock isn't quite lined up right. All those little things. So that means somebody, meaning you, have to go walk around the whole site test all those things, try opening all the windows, try all the faucets, make sure, look around at the paint, make sure the paint's been done correctly. All of those little things, sometimes big things, but usually it's fairly little things that have to get finished uh, before final completion can be done. Uh, so, you know, in a simple situation, it might be fairly straightforward and, and pretty quick, uh, but there are times when the punch list can, can take a long time. I've done I remember doing a punch list for uh, it was like a 35 unit building or something, um, and you know we had a punch list that was 300 items long, something like that. It's it's pretty easy to get big numbers in those things because you know it's a lot of little things that you have to you have to track down and find and make sure are working. So uh, A and B are both uh, sort of plausible answers, but not the best answer. So our best answer is going to be C. So I'm just going to tell you right now that uh, substantial completion is the moment when the client can move in. Now, there's an interesting thing here, though, which is the key word for me is the word can. Uh, it isn't necessarily a good idea for the client to move in at substantial completion. What it means is they can move in. So it means that things are uh, code... Uh, finished enough, so there's uh, not any dangerous elements. The things that need to be finished are not going to uh, impact uh, the code uh, reviews. But that doesn't mean that they're like really, really close to actual finish. If you imagine you have contractors working on a site, let's say painter is working, and then you start moving in the client, that could be a really bad mix of uh, contractors and, uh, you know, uh, office people working, you know, bringing their desks in and uh, like it's just sort of one of those things that has to be very closely uh, checked to when the really the appropriate time for substantial completion is. The technically appropriate time is as soon as the building is available uh, to be moved into uh, where it meets enough of the code that the, the uh, inspectors will feel comfortable with the clients moving in. You actually claim substantial completion. The contractors will ask for it. You would then uh, substantiate it. You might do that with a code official. Depends on the municipality. Uh, and uh, a key thing that happens at substantial completion is it's the starting point of the warranties. So you don't want to go out of your way to start it too early 
but if the client needs to get in, you may need to push things along and get it started so that they can get in and they'll just have to work it out uh, with, their, uh, with the GC to try to not uh, damage anything during the process. You can imagine how much fun it is trying to figure out if the ding in the wall is from one of the client people moving a desk in versus somebody who's on the contractor's team moving a ladder around. Uh, and that always uh, engenders fun conversations. Uh, d final uh, waiver of lien. I'm going to talk more about waiver of lien in a little bit, so I'm going to leave that one. Let's go on to the next one. What is the pencil draw? So this is a, obviously kind of an old-timey term, um, because who uses pencils anymore, except maybe me. Um, but let's take a look at what some of our answers are. Uh, a, sketches that the architect produces during the construction administration phase to make clarifications or convey more information. Uh, B, when the architect produces an estimate of percent of completion for the owner to use for their monthly payout to the contractor. C, when the contractor produces a spreadsheet sworn statement that includes all the trades on the project and how much they have each billed the GC. And D, uh, the process of adding red lines to official drawing set to record the as-built drawings, as-built aspects of the construction uh, as it differs from the contractor drawings. Uh, so I'm just going to run through and get rid of a couple of these. Uh, D uh, is definitely not it, um, though it's an interesting one that the idea of somebody keeping track of the as-built uh, typically that's the contractors as they go along are sort of taking notes on the drawings. And then uh, as uh, also typically uh, as a as sort of an extra to the contract as an additional service, you might take those as built uh, um, sketch pieces of information and develop it into a full set of drawings. Uh, different situations would require that. Uh, not every situation would require it, but the idea of there being a difference between what the contract drawings look like and what the final building looks like is sort of a, something that you should understand and that there may be a need to have that be documented through the as-built. Uh, but that's not what the pencil draw is about. Um, similarly, A is also sketches. The pencil draw is actually not about sketches or drawing at all. Um, so I'm going to take A out. So then the question is, is it B or C? And you can actually figure this out pretty fast when you look at B and you say, when the architect produces an estimate of percent of completion. Uh, in general, the architect doesn't do that. The only time an architect would would be um, if there's a, a conflict um, or a change order going on, something where there's a there's a discussion happening. But essentially, the uh, schedule, the percent of completion, the means and methods, that's all part of the GC's world. So uh, B is not it um, because the architect does not actually produce that estimate. So C, which is when the contractor produces a spreadsheet, sworn statement. So this is a big list of all the different trades on the project. So it'll say, you know, uh, plumber, um, it'll say ca carpenters, uh, it'll say uh, electricians, et cetera, et cetera. So each of those folks will have uh, their place in a big chart, and that chart will then have what's their total dollar amount. Uh, so we know that what each trade uh, totally is. And then there'll be the overhead and profit, so overhead and uh, plus profit, then other kinds of uh, things that are part of the GC's element. So all that gets added up, and then that gets added up, and you have a total amount for the project. So there's the, the actual bid number that the uh, contractor gave to the owner, uh, and it's all of those things all listed. But then it's also uh, what their percentage of completion is. Uh, what each one of those at this moment is. So if we're on month number one, well then excavation and concrete are probably pretty far along in their percent of complete, but maybe electricians very little. Uh, there might be a little bit of site work, but probably not much until there's something to put your conduit and wires into. 
Uh, so the percent of completion will change as it goes through for each individual trade as you go along. Uh, so this document sort of keeps a running tab uh, that tells us, well, what's the total amount? There'll be, are there any changes or change orders to the total amount? And then there'll be each uh, line item for each plumber, each uh, carpenter, or each of the different trades. Uh, are there any specialty information about them? Then there's the percent of completion. Then how much do they get paid out this, uh, for this payout review? How much have they already been paid from in the previous payouts, which let's assume are monthly, although they don't have to be. They could be milestone or something else, but typically monthly. Uh, and then uh, you get to the retainer section. And the retainage is the idea that we're, let's say we're gonna pay the plumbers $22,000. Uh, but we might have, say, a 10% uh, retainage, which means that 10% of that 22 gets put off to the side in a special escrow account. So that's a way of getting those plumbers to come back and finish stuff off at the very end. Um, but we can then, once they are done, once we get to uh, sort of final completion, everybody gets paid out. Actually, often substantial completion, depending on the trade. So this is this great big document. It's got all of these different numbers in it, but it's the way that you sort of keep track of the big numbers, but then also each trade and how much of work they've done up to that point. The reason it's called a pencil draw is because back in the day, you would literally do this in pencil, and then you'd meet at the site, everybody would talk about it, and you'd erase out the numbers that nobody could agree on, and you put new numbers in. So you did it in pencil, not in pen, in order to make it easy to have, it, have that be a conversation. Obviously, nobody does it in pencil anymore. It's all done on spreadsheets. Uh, and as you go along, uh, this, they do the spreadsheet. Uh, we, we go through the pencil draw. Uh, if I agree with all those numbers, I uh, am willing to sign the form. Otherwise, we talk about what the number should be. Uh, so, well, the plumbers really, are they really at 70% complete, but they haven't done any of the, uh, of the stacks yet? Well, that's probably not 70, that's probably more like, uh, I don't know, 40%, right? So we have a conversation about what's the, what's the reasonable amount done on the job site. Uh, once we get to a point where we all agree, uh, then they produce the final version uh, of that month's payout. Uh, I sign it as the architect, the contractor signs it, and then that goes to the owner, and the owner uses that as a tool to know how much they should pay the GC. They pay the GC, the GC then takes that money and then pays all of those individual uh, trades people. Uh, so the, all of that gets paid, and the retainage goes off to the escrow account uh, in the bank somewhere. So, pencil draw produced by the contractor, reviewed by the architect, uh, signed off by both contractor and architect, and then used, uh, once it becomes the final draw, not the pencil draw, used by the owner to pay everybody, to pay the GC who then pays everybody. Okay, that was complicated. Number four, the plumber is owed $62,340 for the work done on the project two months prior. Unless satisfied, this subcontractor will likely, it's kind of fun, I like, unless satisfied, it's sort of like they're having a duel or something. Um, but uh, unless they uh, somehow uh, are uh, treated fairly, uh, what are they gonna, what are they likely to, to do to fix this situation? So A, write a formal request letter to the IDM, which is the initial decision maker, which is typically the architect. Uh, B, hire a lawyer. C, direct their next correspondence to the client slash owner, or D, submit a mechanics lien. So here's the part where we're gonna talk about mechanics lien. And the answer is mechanics lien. So in this situation, the plumber is owed quite a lot of money and it's past due. Now, whether you do a mechanics lien in two months, like projects sometimes get a month or so behind, uh, it's kind of a lot of paperwork, so you may not do it right off, the, right off the bat. But two months, you start getting pretty close. You're a little nervous about it. You're gonna to wanna to, to, get, to get paid. You're gonna be nervous that you're not gonna get paid if, you're, if things are taking that long. So what can you do? Well, what you essentially do, what a mechanics lien is, is that the plumber goes uh, to whatever 
county or municipality, uh, the, the place uh, in, in that state where these things are done. Uh, and they effectively say that they are claiming a percent of ownership of this piece of property and the work that's going on there. So they are owed $62,340. So if this whole site is worth uh, $2 million, then they say, okay, we are claiming uh, the percent that would be uh, um, uh, 62,000 over $2 million. Uh, we're claiming that percent of ownership of this site because we have not been paid. And that goes into the, uh, and sort of lives with the, the deed of the, of the site. Um, so if anything is going to happen, like any bank transfer is gonna happen, any change from one bank uh, loan to another, if somebody's gonna sell something, uh, those all go through that point of, uh, of juncture in, at the municipality. And so it becomes a lien and that lien means that none of the banks are going to uh, let that loan go through or make that sale or whatever it is until the lien is satisfied. So the mechanics lien, uh, and I'm, I don't really know why it's called a mechanics lien, it's always kind of been funny to me, um, but the mechanics lien, the concept there is, this is a way for the small guy to be able to make sure that they are actually getting uh, a, a chance that it can't just be pushed around by the heavyweights. So the big GC or the big owner that's got lots of money and they're, and they're not paying the small guys because they want to you know, mess around with their money while, uh, and pay them as late as they can. This is a way for the plumber in this case to say, too bad, uh, like I'm gonna s essentially stop this project uh, from being able to do any official thing if you don't go through and make this, uh, make this right. So it's a really important concept. You've probably heard of the waiver of lien. Uh, a waiver of lien means that the plumber says, oh, I just got my check for 62,340. So all good, I waive my right to lien uh, on this project. So I'm saying, I don't need this uh, to, I don't need to worry about this because I am in good shape, I've been paid, I'm waiving my, my rights to a mechanics lien. But anybody who does work on a project, could be the architect, could be a, a subcontractor, uh, could be any number of other people, they have a, always have a right to uh, put a lien on a project. All right. I think we're down to 14 at this point. Okay, number five. This one might have a little controversy to it, so we'll see how we go. Controversy. Yeah. Uh, in the buildup to the bidding process, it becomes clear that the architect and the owner are equally unsure about the cost of the pro what, what the cost of the project will be. So like if you imagine maybe it's a, a um, adaptive reuse, uh, something like that where there's uh, quite a lot of, unsure, you're unsure about what's inside once you start opening walls up, uh, things like that. So you know there's gonna be cost, but you're just not 100% sure about what's, uh, uh, what's going on. Uh, and they are worried that the bidders will all come, out, come in too high for the budget availability. Check three possible elements that might be added to the bid form to help control the costs. So what could you put in the bid form to make your life better for when the, all the bids come in too high uh, that you have the ability to sort of uh, carve the project out of it? Uh, and the answers are going to be we have an answer for A is going to be a correct answer. C is a correct answer. D is a correct answer. Uh, time limitation forms is, uh, that's a made up thing, um, but it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, promissory notes is something completely different, uh, financial, but com completely different. Performance bond I'll come back to in just a second. That one is actually potentially a pretty good answer, but I think allowances in this uh, setup is actually a little bit better of an answer. Uh, so an ad alt, um, sometimes you'll see them as deduct alt. Uh, this is where you might say, all right, we, here's our bid form. Our bid form is for this community center. Uh, what's the total price? And that's your bid form. But then you might say, also, what if we didn't include the pool? Uh, 
Uh, also, what if we didn't include uh, the east wing uh, that has the three classrooms? And that way you're getting the full price, but then you're getting a few other prices uh, that you would be able to deduct off. How much would we save if we didn't include the pool? How much would we save if we did? Or um, you might do it the other way. Here's our, our community center. Um, and then what if we added the pool? I and mean, what if we added the East Wing that has those three classrooms? So a couple different ways of approach, but the idea of providing a place to be able to get information back so that when you get all those numbers, you have the ability to say, all right, the overall project, just like we were worried, came in 30% too high, but once we subtracted the, the deduct, now we're only 5% too high. And then that's a real conversation you can have. You might make other changes, you might not, um, but you're trying to give you and the owner enough information uh, from those bidders to be able to carve uh, the project out of it that makes sense with the budget that they have. So some other ones, the uh, square footage uh, unit costs for specific line items, that would be an example like, uh, you know, this community center would be awesome if we had terrazzo floors. They'd be durable forever. They, it would just be, it's a great way to do it. Uh, if you can afford it, it's going to be the absolute best. But terrazzo floors, well, those are going to be a lot more expensive than, say, a vinyl tile floor. Uh, so you might put the uh, terrazzo, or you might put the vinyl tile in uh, and then ask for, but what if we did terrazzo? What per square foot cost would you give us if we put terrazzo in? Uh, and then that way, down the road, if we choose a bidder, they can't later sort of come up with some outrageous price for the terrazzo uh, because they've already put it into their bid uh, response. So that might be a linear feed of a certain uh, you know, kind of material, uh, it could be square footage of a certain roofing material, or flooring material. It could be any number of different unit costs that you sort of have them list in order to be able to give you information after the bid, again, to craft the final project uh, that is still promised information. It's real information from the bidders, uh, but it's giving you this sort of ability to sort of tie everything together uh, at the price point that, that actually will, will hopefully work. Uh, and then allowances is a little different. Allowances, um, that's when you're just, uh, like you're still trying to work on things. You're still trying to figure things out. Uh, like maybe you haven't chosen all the light fixtures yet uh, because you, you know other things are still so up in the air. And so you say, all right, uh, as part of the allowances, you're gonna put in your bid uh, $20,000 for light fixtures. Um, and in that process of those $20,000 for light fixtures, uh, then we know that that will cover at least some idea of what light fixtures would be, um, but we can then work to later to sort of hold back. So we're not just sort of going further and further and further along and letting the prices uh, go uh, astronomically high. Uh, so those are the three. Uh, the performance bond is kind of an interesting answer. The only thing that makes that not a reasonable answer is you wouldn't really put that on the bid form. Um, but the performance bond is when an owner gets essentially an insurance policy that the uh, bidder will actually be able to do the project for the price that they bid it at. Uh, you know, if the bidder goes out of business during the middle of the construction uh, and they leave, it's very, very, very expensive to get the, uh, a new contractor in to sort of pick up the uh, where they left off and get going is all this setup time and everything. And it's a very expensive process. And so the owner can get a performance bond saying, yes, the contractor, will, we will uh, guarantee, we will bond uh, that the contractor will finish. And if they don't, then we'll find somebody who finishes it. And then we, the insurance company, will pay the extra cost. You will only ever have to pay the amount that you uh, initially uh, got with the, with the original bidder. Um, so it actually does help keep the costs in check, but only in certain situations and not really on the bid form. Awesome. Well, we have quite a few winners here, which we'll get to in a minute. But um, uh, I do have two questions here maybe mm -hmm. that we can talk about. One is from Marissa. She asked uh, earlier, she said, is there another term for this or is it always called the pencil draw? Uh, there's actually, there's, there are a bunch of other terms, but um, uh, pencil draw is a pretty common um, 
it's actually written into often into uh, contracts and things like that. But there are a couple of other terms, and I am unfortunately blanking on them. The payment application is the other is the thing a couple yeah. of folks are sort of well. The payment application is, um, but the the payment application is the thing that has multiple lives, and what you're talking about is the first version of it. Yeah. Um, so it's the draft payment application. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's probably the best other term for it. Um, I like pencil draw because it has a certain you know, you can kind of imagine uh, Sullivan or somebody out there in the, in the, in the, you know, literally writing a bunch of numbers on a on a piece of paper somewhere, and uh, like them going through it. Like it has a certain sense of history to it, which I enjoy. That's right. Um, a couple of questions here about substantial completion and certificates of occupancy. Uh, basically, do you need a certificate of occupancy before substantial completion? You can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I didn't mention certificate of occupancy uh, kind of specifically because I, I didn't really want to get too deep into it. Um, uh, they're pretty similar, but they come from sort of different places. The reason, uh, not every project needs to get a certificate of occupancy. Um, and so you don't, and, and, and not every project bothers with a substantial completion. Like if things are just sort of rolling along and it's going to be, you know, it's a matter of a couple of days before you're going to be finally complete, nobody's going to bother declaring substantial completion because there's just no, there's no point in doing any paperwork or anything like that. Um, so you don't need to do either of them. However, let's say, for example, a multifamily, um, uh, you've got a condo or an apartment building or something like that. Uh, you're not going to be allowed to let uh, people move in without getting a certificate of occupancy. So that's the situation, the, the, the CFOs, the certificates of occupancies are for those situations where the uh, inspectors are nervous enough that there's enough of a population of people moving in uh, that the, the dangers are real. Um, so. For example, you, you wouldn't really need a CFO for a lot of uh, uh, like farm buildings or you know, things like that where you still have to build a building, there's still safety issues, there's still all of those things, but there's just not that same level of expectation. Um, so they're similar, but they, they have subtle differences. All right, awesome. Um, well, thank you, Mike. I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap right there. So um, I want to thank you for joining. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for listening in. At our next ARE Live podcast, we're going we're gonna to give you a sneak peek into Mike's A19 presentation and cover uh, one of the uh, top uh, tips for passing the ARE. It's a really good session. So if you're going to be at A19, you should definitely register to attend. Um, if you're not, um, or even if you are, we're going to drill into that one particular topic um, where we're going to be focusing on knowing your contracts. So if you want to um, uh, uh, sign up to uh, listen in on that webinar, um, I also posted that, that link for you as well. Or you can just go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast uh, to register to attend. Uh, to learn more about our ARE exam prep curriculum, you can go to blackspectacles.com or you can try out any of the free course videos. Um, if you would like your boss to pay for your membership, be sure to visit blackspectacles.com slash firms to learn more about our firm's uh, firm memberships for firms of any size. Uh, and then for those of you who are ready to start preparing for the ARE right now, you can use coupon code CE. 41619YT to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your ARE exam prep membership. So then finally tomorrow we'll send you an email follow-up about today's live broadcast. So please let us know what you think, share any suggestions that you may have. Uh, we read every word that you write and use them between our next episodes. So thanks for watching.